Hey everyone, it's Jacqueline for Pixie Dust PhD. And in today's video, we are going to be talking about my 2021 Walt Disney World trip planning. Planning a Walt Disney World trip is almost ridiculously intricate. If you wanna see roughly how I break down the steps, go ahead and check out this video. I'll leave a link in the description below or you can click the card in the corner. There are quite a lot of steps to planning a Walt Disney World trip. So this will be the first video in a series. Today, we'll be talking about savings, timing, and accommodations. If you enjoy this peek inside my brain during the chaos of planning a Walt Disney World trip, please hit that thumbs up button to like the video and consider subscribing to the channel. Ring the bell icon for notifications whenever I post new videos. And be sure to let me know in the comments down below where you are at for your trip planning or if you have any clutch advice for me. Previously on this channel, I have rambled a little bit about 2021 trip planning. However, nothing in that video was an actual plan, so we're gonna go ahead and call that a pre-planning musings video. Check out that video if you wanna hear about some of my make or break decision points about traveling to Walt Disney World in 2021. You can click the card in the corner or I'll leave a link in the description below. Essentially, that video boils down to the fact that I'm not going to ignore a public health crisis just for vacation, and also I don't really wanna pay the full rate to go to Walt Disney World with less than full offerings. There are some things that I'm willing to bend on, but for example, nighttime spectaculars and meeting characters is quite important to the enjoyment of my trip personally. When I filmed this video with all those variables up in the air, I was feeling quite paralyzed about even starting to plan anything. Ultimately, I really actually enjoy the planning process for any vacation. I find working out the logistics, deciding what we're going to do, and the anticipation of it all to be really fun. Therefore, once we got through the right of first refusal process on our Disney Vacation Club resale contract offer, we decided that I would just go ahead and start planning a trip. And furthermore, I would plan this trip as if the public health crisis was significantly less disastrous. I won't say, you know, fully under control, but very much getting there. Essentially, I would be planning this trip as if we were going to Walt Disney World like it was any other year. If we do need to cut back on our vacation plans because of the pandemic or cancel altogether, well, so be it. But certainly planning a full trip and then cutting back later is a lot more fun than planning a very trimmed down trip from the start. This trip will only be myself and my partner. The way we normally plan trips is one person does a majority of the planning and just checks in with the other person occasionally about various options. For the most part, I'm gonna be the one planning our Walt Disney World trip and I will just check in with my partner about various choices we have along the way. Before we get into the nitty gritty details of my trip planning, let's go over one thing. I'm going to take a moment to ask all of you to pinky promise to me that you're only going to use this information for fun and entertainment. It's difficult to talk about trip planning without talking about specific dates. This is especially true when you consider Disney Vacation Club is in the mix and there are specific seasons for Disney Vacation Club. Certainly from the information today and moving forward, you will be able to piece together when I'm going to be at Walt Disney World. Right now, all together, I'm going to ask everyone that we promise each other we will not use any of this information for inappropriate behavior, including harassment and stalking. Okay? Okay, great. First up in my list of steps is savings. Prior to owning Disney Vacation Club, I would always estimate that a longer trip to Walt Disney World would cost several thousand dollars. Ideally, we would have $5,000 saved to cover all the expenses. Of course, a lot of your expenses are going to be lodging costs. Naturally, this will vary depending on where you're staying, but budgeting out a couple thousand dollars is usually a good bet. Then I generally like to budget out $100 per person per day for food. Theme park tickets are a rather expensive and unavoidable cost. While we don't normally end up spending quite this much, I do like to budget $900 per person. This covers theme park tickets for both Universal and Walt Disney World. Flights I assume will be able to snag for $300 per person or less. Currently, I live in the Metro Washington DC area, so there's quite a few airports to choose from. Several airports means lots of flights, which also creates competition. It's not unusual to find round trip tickets down to Orlando from this general area for around $100 to $200 per person. I have absolutely seen it go up to $350 per person or even higher around the holiday time though. Luckily, my partner and I are relatively flexible and so we would be able to move our trip dates a couple days if it meant saving several hundred dollars on flights. I don't think we'll end up spending $300 per person on flights, but this is what I like to budget for. This brings a 10 day trip total cost to over $6,000. And without lodging even, it's still over $4,000. Primarily, we'll be staying at Disney Vacation Club villas on points we already own, so that will certainly help with the lodging costs. Overall, I would also say this is definitely an overestimate. If you take an average over all of the days, we never end up actually spending $100 per person per day on food. Similarly, the flight costs and the ticket costs are also slight overestimates. At the end of the day, personally, I would just rather have a high savings goal and do my best to meet that in advance. And then when the bill comes and it's actually less than the amount I've saved, I feel very good about that. I prefer this logic and the psychological way it feels than budgeting very conservatively and potentially overspending that amount. Also note that my partner and I really don't buy souvenirs, so I don't have anything in the budget for that. If you're working towards a saving goal for a Walt Disney World vacation and you know you want to buy a boatload of stuff while you're down there, definitely add that into your budget. As far as savings goes, my partner and I have a separate bank account that we set up for vacation-related activities. 
In order to save to buy Disney Vacation Club, we were each adding $100 per paycheck into this account, and then I was topping it off as I could. We have since bought our Disney Vacation Club contract, but we are continuing this practice of adding $100 per paycheck into the account. This is money we're going to use to pay for Disney Vacation Club dues, and once that's paid off every year, the rest will be our general vacation fund. I want to emphasize, as I have in prior videos, that we absolutely save for other more important things first and more rigorously. For example, I also have a separate bank account for my medical expenses, and I add quite a lot more money into that every month than I do into our vacation fund. I also know that not everyone has the means to save at this rate, and we certainly are fortunate, especially during this time. But in general, if you have a savings goal, whether that's for Disney Vacation Club, a vacation, a car, a house, whatever, I certainly find having a separate bank account very helpful. Having an account at a completely different bank means that it requires a lot of extra effort to dip into that money. So I'm never unintendedly taking money out of this account and away from our goal. It's a good strategy that works for us, and I am very confident by the time we're on vacation, we will have enough money saved to pay off this trip. Step two is timing. So realistically, when can you even go on vacation? My partner and I generally don't have very many constraints of when we can or cannot travel based on our job schedules. I do have a couple of key events that I can't miss, but they are few and far between. Allotted and accrued vacation time is probably the biggest factor for my partner and I. Because we didn't go anywhere in 2020, I am carrying over quite a lot of vacation days into 2021, so I know that I will certainly have plenty of time to go on a longer vacation. My partner, however, is in transition between jobs, so we really aren't sure what their vacation situation will be like yet. However, part of the agreement of planning our ideal trip is that my partner told me just to plan the trip as if they would have as much vacation as I wanted, and that's what I'm going to do. If they don't end up having that much vacation allotted by the time we want to travel, we will figure it out and cut back. As previously discussed in that pre-planning musings video, we'll be headed down to Walt Disney World in September of 2021. There are a lot of factors to this, but there are two very prominent ones. The first being that the 50th anniversary of the Magic Kingdom, and therefore Walt Disney World, is October 1st, 2021, and I want to get down there before those crowds start to get very bad. The second is the Disney Vacation Club points chart. So there are Disney Vacation Club seasons, and certain seasons cost less points per night than other seasons. The entire month of September is contained within the two cheapest Disney Vacation Club seasons. I am a relatively frugal person, so I'd like to see my points go as far as possible. Step three is accommodations. You really don't absolutely have to start this step this early, but certainly with us being Disney Vacation Club owners, it is beneficial. Planning accommodations early also helps force me to start sketching out the basics of the trip. So in my head, who knows what reality will end up being, but in my head for now, the ideal situation is this would be approximately a two-week trip. We would start at Universal for a few days, and then we would make our way to Disney World for the majority of the time. At Universal, we will not stay on property. There's a Doubletree Hotel across a large road from the entrance to Universal. I believe it's the 435. There is a crosswalk to get safely across this road, and the walk from the hotel all the way into the parks is probably about a mile. It's certainly not super close, but we have stayed here before and done this walk, and I find it to be fine. The rates at this hotel also tend to be really awesome, and you can often find them for under $100 a night. I totally think that's worth a 20-minute walk to and from the parks. We've had a great experience here before, so I really don't see any reason not to go back. After a few days at Universal, we'll transfer over to Disney. I'm not yet sure if we're going to have a rental car for the entire vacation or for just a few days even. If we do end up getting a rental car, I will work that into the budget. I can also pretty safely assume that the savings we'll have on flights, tickets, and food combined will cover the cost of the rental car. The first few days at Disney, I'm not entirely sure what we're going to do. We'll go over this in more detail in a minute. But basically, I think we'll end up doing a split stay between two Disney Vacation Club resorts. Another option would be an off-site hotel or a value accommodation at Disney for the first couple of nights and then a Disney Vacation Club resort for the second couple of nights. After those nights where I'm not really sure what's happening yet, we will be transferring over to Bay Lake Tower to finish out our vacation. The Bay Lake Tower portion of the trip is already booked and I'm super excited. As this is an unusual year, my partner and I did discuss how many points we wanted to spend. We have a Bay Lake Tower home resort contract that's 90 points per year with an August use year. While we are within that 11-month home resort priority booking window, so October of 2020 for a September of 2021 trip, we decided we did not want to borrow any points just yet. Traditionally, once you borrow points, they cannot be moved again. So if we borrowed 2022 points for this trip and we ended up canceling, even if we ended up canceling more than 31 days in advance, traditionally, those points from 2022 would now stay in the 2021 use year. As of the last time I spoke to someone actually employed at Disney Vacation Club, which was in November of 2020, they were actually offering the courtesy of unborrowing points for you. This is highly unusual. So if you borrowed points to book a vacation and then you canceled that vacation more than 31 days in advance, they would actually unborrow those points for you and put them back in their future use year. This is an unusual circumstance that absolutely could change any day. The standard is 100% that once you move points, you can't move them back. This is a really nice courtesy that Disney Vacation Club is offering to their members, but it is a temporary policy that could change at any day, so I'm certainly not counting on it. Currently, there is also a 50% limit on borrowing. So typically, you can borrow up to 100% of your points from your next use year. Right now, that's cut in half. There is no official word about when this limit will end. 
With these caveats in mind, I'm doing my trip planning under the assumption that things will be as strict as possible. This means I'm assuming that borrowing will still be limited to 50% by the time I'm booking my vacation, and also that if I cancel, my points will stay in whatever use year they were moved to, and they will not continue this unborrowing effort. While I am absolutely optimistic that by September of 2021, we will be able to safely head down to Walt Disney World and have a lovely time, we did not want to completely ignore the fact that we may end up canceling. The planned trip falls at the beginning of our 2021 use year. We bought a strict contract, which means there are zero points in the current 2020 use year. Our first allotment of 90 points comes in 2021, and then we do have the full 90 points also in 2022. If we cancel the September 2021 trip more than 31 days in advance, meaning that our points don't have any penalties on them, we would have to use those by the end of the use year, which is July of 2022. Alternatively, since the trip is planned for the very beginning of the use year, we would actually have until March 31st of 2022 to bank our 2021 points into 2022. Any borrowed points cannot be banked and then would need to be used by July of 2022 if Disney Vacation Club is not still doing this nice practice of unborrowing points for their members. With all that in mind, our 11-month booking window opened up in October for a September of 2021 trip. Surprisingly, we actually got access to our DVC points relatively soon after that 11-month window opened up. And because it was so soon to the 11-month window, there was pretty good availability. At the time, in October, we were pretty hesitant about borrowing points and wanted to stay within our one use year's allotment of points. So we moved forward with booking only what we could with 90 points. One week in the cheapest Disney Vacation Club season at Bay Lake Tower is 97 points for a standard view studio. Obviously, if we aren't borrowing anything, I only have 90 points to spend. So I can't simply just book one full week in a standard view studio. I went ahead and figured out various combinations of rooms that we could stay in to maximize our nights at Bay Lake Tower on 90 points alone. There are several iterations where a vast majority of the trip is spent in a standard view room and does come in under 90 points. However, my partner and I are pretty fine with moving rooms, so staying put is not a priority. We started looking at other combinations of rooms that we could get for six nights, so checking in on Sunday and checking out on Saturday. There were two main considerations we had. One, we wanted the standard view room to come first, even though points-wise it would be cheapest on the weekend and therefore cheapest to end on. But I prefer my stays to always sort of go up in category, so starting in the standard view room was important. And two, it would be really fun to get a theme park view room. Because the theme park view room is so expensive on weekend nights, we decided we had to work that into the weekdays. But again, I don't want to go from a theme park view all the way back down to a standard view, so we decided that we could go from theme park view down to lake view, but not standard view. You absolutely could do the opposite, start at theme park or lake view, switch those, and then end at standard view, but it just feels anticlimactic to me. So we landed on most of the nights being in a standard view, then moving to a theme park view, and then moving to a lake view. This is 89 total points out of our 90 available. And we get to try out all three view categories. For the rest of the trip, which would be the earlier portion because I want to end at Bay Lake Tower, we would then have one point left over from our 2021 use year, and we could borrow half of our 2022 use year points, which would be 45 total. For Disney Vacation Club, you can book resorts that aren't your home resort seven months in advance. So seven months prior to September 2021 is February 2021. I'm filming this in December of 2020, so I don't have anything booked yet. I am operating under the assumption that by February of 2021, my partner and I will be okay with borrowing points. My personal outlook in December of 2020 compared to October of 2020 for the future is certainly improved. It may not end up being true that we're fine borrowing points come February, but again, I'm planning my ideal trip here. In total, we'd have 46 vacation points to use. That's the one point from 2021 that's left over, and then half of our 90 2022 points. Then, if needed, Disney Vacation Club members, including resale members, are able to purchase one-time use vacation points currently at a rate of $19 per point. You can buy up to 24 of these per year. I would like to minimize the amount of one-time use vacation points we buy just to keep our lodging costs down, though. Looking at those four nights and trying to keep costs to a minimum, particularly if we don't want to move around resorts, there are several good options. If we were able to snag a standard view boardwalk room, that would come in at 44 points. Similarly, a room at Old Key West would also be 44 points. A standard view studio at the Animal Kingdom Villas, either Jumbo or Kidani side, would be 46 points. A Saratoga Springs Resort standard view room would come in at 48 points, meaning we would have to purchase two one-time use vacation points for a total of $38. However, again, I won't be able to book any of this until February, so who knows what availability will be like. If we take a quick peek at availability now, you can see the standard view studios at Animal Kingdom Villas, both the Jumbo and Kidani side, are looking pretty good. You'll notice throughout all these examples that September 30th is waitlist only, that's that light blue color, meaning they're totally booked. This makes sense since that is the night before the 50th anniversary. See what I mean about crowds? It's gonna be bad. I like the Animal Kingdom Villas, and especially if we have a rental car, the parking situation at Kidani is amazing. But we have stayed there before, and it's kind of far removed from other theme parks, so it probably wouldn't be my first choice. Availability at Saratoga Springs Resorts looks pretty good, and it could be very convenient to have that short walk over to Disney Springs. The standard rooms at Old Key West look fairly available, but those near the hospitality house are slightly more booked. I wouldn't mind staying here either, and given how much inventory there is between Saratoga Springs and Old Key West, I would be surprised if at seven months they were fully booked. But you can see availability in those standard view rooms at the boardwalk is already pretty limited. 
I am definitely not banking on being able to stay here, at least in a standard view room, and certainly not for all four of those nights. As I previously mentioned, my partner and I don't really mind moving hotels, so this is an interesting opportunity for a split stay. I especially don't mind the notion of moving hotels earlier in the stay, knowing that for the next six nights after we check out of this last room, we will be snug at Bay Lake Tower. We could do a split stay between Saratoga Springs and the Boardwalk, which are options I just showed you if we wanted to stay at the same place the whole time. The split stay here would cost 46 points, so no extra money for us. If we did a split between the Polynesian and the Boardwalk, that would be 56 points or 10 extra points, which would be $190 extra. That's maybe a little bit pricey, but it's certainly an appealing thought. A split stay between Beach Club and Boardwalk would be 54 points or $152 extra. You'll notice the options I'm presenting really stack the Boardwalk View standard rooms on the weekend because they are a relatively cheap amount of points to stay for a weekend night. But if those standard view rooms book up, perhaps we could snag a preferred view. This would be the boardwalk view or a garden or pool view. These preferred view rooms do of course cost more points per night, but all things considered, they're still a fairly reasonable amount of points for weekend nights. Combining a boardwalk preferred view room weekend stay with Old Key West would be 50 points or 76 extra dollars. Or combining with a slightly more expensive Saratoga Springs Resort would be 54 points total or 114 extra dollars. Part of the appeal of a split stay for me would be trying out the dining plan. We'll talk more in detail about that in a different planning video. But right now, my partner and I have not decided between a two-night dining plan or a three-night dining plan. All of these options would open us up to a two-night dining plan well, but if we wanted to do a three-night dining plan, we would need a reservation that was three nights. There are, of course, some interesting options for that as well. Again, I'm just going to assume that I'm not going to be able to get three consecutive nights at the boardwalk in a standard view studio. And perhaps you've noticed a lot of these have proximity to Epcot. I think snack credits are often best spent at Epcot, and in general, a lot of the dining I want to do is in that area. So access to Epcot would be key. If we wanted a three-night dining plan and therefore needed a three-night reservation, here are some cool options. We could do three consecutive nights in a preferred view room at the boardwalk, which would come in at 46 points. A beach club studio for three nights would only be 44 points. The poly for three nights would be 51 points, so we would need to buy five points, which would be $95. And then for any of these plans for Wednesday night, I'm not totally sure what would happen. We could buy one-time use vacation points for a cheaper resort, say Old Key West, which is nine points. That would be $171 to stay there for the one night. Or it's very possible that we might stay off-site or in a value accommodation if that ended up being much cheaper. All of the decisions about the non-Bay Lake Tower Disney Vacation Club resort stays are largely going to be affected by what availability looks like in February. I'll definitely keep you posted, but let me know in the comments down below what your preference would be. So overall, this is the general sketch of step three accommodations. Remember, everything may shift by a day or two depending on flights, but I think that the general sketch will remain the same. We'll start off at Universal and we'll stay off-site. For that first arrival day, depending on what time we arrive, we may end up just staying at an airport hotel instead. We'll do a couple days at Universal to experience all the things that we haven't done yet. Both my partner and I are huge coaster fans, so it's a really fun time for us. Then we'll move from Universal to perhaps an offsite hotel, or maybe we'll move straight into Disney Vacation Club resorts. I think there's next to no chance that between that Tuesday or Wednesday and that Saturday that we'll be staying in the same place the whole time. I am fully expecting this will be two or three different hotels. Sometime in there, hopefully we'll have the dining plan, and also hopefully we'll be able to snag a DVC resort in the Epcot area. And then starting Sunday, we will move to Bay Lake Tower. We'll start in a standard view room for several nights, move to a theme park view room, and then down to a lake view room. Then we're checking out of Bay Lake Tower. From there, we will either be leaving and departing for home, or if we need to add a night or two in order to make flights as cheap as possible, we'll probably just stay at off-site hotels. Next up in my steps of trip planning, step four is to make a general sketch of your trip. However, to make that make more sense for you, you and I may talk about my dining plan options before then. Those are both absolutely going to be their own videos. I think there's a ton to talk about, and I can tell that this video is already getting quite long. So let's wrap this video up here and pick up the trip planning video series another time. Let me know if you have any questions about all the planning chaos going on inside my brain. You can leave a comment down below, or you can always find me on other social media platforms like Twitter and Instagram at PixieDustPhD. And certainly if you're currently trip planning, let me know what exciting things you have up your sleeve. I hope the rest of your day is truly wonderful and we'll see you real soon at Pixie Dust PhD.